will also know what you have been talking about earlier. I know you will also talk about some, some other things here. But it's so interesting to hear what you have been doing in Australia mm -hmm. and especially your carbon story. So mm -hmm. welcome here. Yeah, yes. <laughs> Nils decides where you are. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Thank you very much. Thank you for the invitation uh, to come. Thank you, Jay, for your dis talk this morning. I, I promise Jay and I haven't met before and we didn't compare notes, but you're going to hear quite a lot of uh, similar things in my talk to Jay's, but from, a, from an Australian perspective. A little bit about my background. Uh, I've been working in agriculture for 30, 30 years. I'm a researcher at the National Science Agency, CSIRO. Uh, all of my research is done on farm, on commercial farms, not on, on a research farm. I, uh, I, I live in a city, but... Um, and my PhD was about soil compaction. Um, and then when I joined CSIRO, um, I was invited by a group of farmers, this is in 1990, uh, a group of farmers who'd been trying no-till, trying to get no-till systems working, had managed to sort of get almost there, but they were still cultivating a little bit, still having to burn stubble. Uh, and they invited us to come out and sort of try to understand what was, the, what was the next step they could take to sort of overcome this. So that's sort of, I've always been looking at trying to take away the constraints to being able to adopt these conservation ag systems. That's the focus. Yeah. Uh, John has been working with landbrug in 30 years, and he worked at CSIRO, which is a research institution. Og han arbejder primært med det praktiske, altså ude hos landmænd, hvor man anlægger forsøg, øh, mere end egentlig forsøgsparceller. Og noget af det, der har beskæftiget ham rigtig meget, det er, at rigtig mange landmænd i 90'erne og 40'erne var gået i gang med nøvtil, men fik ikke rigtig succes med det. De havde nogle, øh, nogle, nogle ting, der haltede, og hvad kunne de gøre for at komme videre og få det hele til at fungere? Og det er det, han har arbejdet meget med, og hans Ph.D. den handlede om jordkomprimering. Det var det, han havde fokus på, dengang han startede. Thanks. So, um, I think Jay already introduced some of these principles. I liked his, his circle, which he followed through his talk, and the different principles behind conservation farming. And I just wanted to show you here that it doesn't really matter what country you live in or what sort of system you're farming in you can find ways to, uh, to try to incorporate these principles into your farming system. And they'll, they're going to be adapted and adopted in different ways. And I would add one extra, um, which I think uh, is important, and it comes back to the soil carbon story, is, about, is thinking about how important nutrition is to, uh, to balance, to, balance uh, to, to improve soil carbon, and, which is what I was talking about in, in Herning. Så det John siger, det er, at de, de vigtige elementer, det er jo netop principperne i, i conservation agriculture med mini, minimal jordbearbejdning, permanent dække af jorden, enten med afgrøde eller rester eller efterafgrøde, og så en sund øh, øh, rotation. Og så siger han en vigtig ting, det er også, at der skal være balancer i gødningsmængderne, næringsstofferne i jorden. Det er meget vigtigt, men han siger også, at man kan introducere det alle steder, uanset om det er med, med, med håndarbejde, et eller andet tropisk område, eller det er Nordamerika, eller det er Australien. Al, alle steder kan man gøre det, men det skal lige tilpasses lidt til de lokale forhold. Thank you. And my talk, my talk's in three parts. First part, I thought I should talk a little bit about Australian farming, just to, to, get, the, oops, to get the mind, the mind into the right, and, and a bit of the history of how we came to be. Um, From my experience, uh, and, and if I was going to give one piece of advice to, to uh, farmers and groups, it's to be pragmatic and flexible in how you attempt to, to adapt these principles to your farm, because there, there'll always be circumstances where um, being very rigid and saying, I'm never going to do that, or I'm always going to do this, will lead to problems. And we've had that happen to us in Australia. And then thirdly, um, just show you some of our latest research and then really ask for questions. Um, because I could talk all day, today and tomorrow, it would be great, but <laughs> I'm sure you don't want that. 
Så det, John øh, han vil tale om i dag, det er øh, den historiske udvikling i australsk øh, landbrug. Den blev jo koloniseret ret sent i historien, og hvad det udviklede sig til, og hvordan de startede på, på CA-systemet. Og så vil han komme meget ind på, at man skal være fleksibel og pragmatisk, i stedet for at mure sig inde i nogle bestemte retninger og sige, at jeg vil kun fokusere på det, så skal man være klar til at ændre attitude og lære nogle andre ting. Og så vil han komme ind med noget af de sidste forskningsresultater, de har dernede, og hvad det kører ud i, og så spørgsmål. Thank you. So, uh, the, I guess the key things about the Australian farming system, um, it's dry. Uh, we have, we have, by and large, very infertile soils. The continent, we haven't had a volcano or a glacier for millions of years, um, and it's been weathered during that time. So the soils are naturally rather infertile. The agriculture is largely unsubsidised, so farmers are getting world prices for their for their products uh, without a lot of subsidies. So that that. All of those things together make it very risky, and it means that the farmers are always thinking very carefully about, you know, what they're going to spend money on. Um, and, and often, even when they see something is a good idea, uh, the risk of not getting a return because of the weather um, sometimes uh, limits that. And the soils can have, we have acid sandy soils, we have compact saline soils, we have every soil constraint we have, um, and that just adds a little bit of uh, a challenge to, to the adoption. And the rainfall uh, changes from summer dominant to uh, equiseasonal to winter dominant or Mediterranean. So, so those graphs just show the, the rainfall distribution through the year. So this just changes a little bit how the, how the system. But, but mostly right across that yellow area, um, it's really one crop per year sown sometime in April or May, harvested in November. So that's sown in autumn, harvested it mm. in summer. And over the summer, it's too hot and dry to, to, to grow a crop. So mostly there's, there's not much done during the summer. Så so, uh, for at uh, fortælle lidt om landbruget i Australien, så er det jo generelt meget uh, tørt, og det er dry land farming, altså uden vanding. Og uh, blandet landbrug også med, med, med husdyr, og han uh, fortæller jo, at nedbøren er fra 3 til 500 meter. Generelt er jorden... Uh, what? Du sagde meter. Millimeter. Ja, men det er bare Meter would be good. Det er godt i morgen. Og så er det meget næringsforfattig uh, jord, fordi den geograf geografiske forhistorie er helt anderledes end uh, både Nordamerika og Sydamerika og Europa. Der har, der har været helt andre uh, forhold gældende, så der er ikke mange næringsstoffer. Og så er det væsentligt også, at det er et landbrug uden støtte, så det er et meget risikabelt landbrug. Og det er også derfor, at landmændene de investerer ikke ret meget, før de er helt sikre på, at det nu også kan betale sig. Fordi nogle gange så er der bare ikke noget at høste, eller meget lidt at høste. Og så viser han lige med nedbørsmængderne, at nogle steder der er det sommerdomineret nedbør, der er, og andre steder er det vinterdomineret nedbør. Men i de gule områder, det er det, det mest almindelige planteproduktion er, altså planteavl. Og der er det jo typisk sådan, at man sår om foråret og høster i november og december, afhængig af, øh, hvor det er henne. Sår om efteråret og høster om Hva? foråret. Ja, altså, <laughs> ja, altså modsat af, hvad vi gør her. Ja. Yeah. Ja. Thanks. Så øh, yeah. det er helt andre forhold, og generelt det der, at det er et enormt risikabelt at være landmand dernede. Yes? Ja. Mm -hmm. yep. so, so just the cropping year... Uh, looks looks like this. Um, as I said, it's dry in the summer, and, and in the summer we're basically trying to capture and store moisture to grow the crop during the winter. Um, we really don't know when and if the rain will come. It might come in March. It might come in June. That's it's very it's very a uh, variable. But um, so sowing will occur um, after the opening rain. The crops. Um, the other risks are frost on the crops if they're flowering. So you can't have the crop flowering too early. You've got to have it flowering after the last frost and we don't know when the last frost will be. Um, and then of course in the summer it's getting hot and dry and, and you're trying to get the grain. So, so these, are the, it, these climatic risks are extremely variable and, and unpredictable and so the farmers are always having to make decisions um, based on the, on the likelihood of, uh, of, the, of the weather. 
Um, but I guess I just wanted the, the main point is that water capture, conservation, storage is is a critical thing that we're always thinking about. So det der er et af hovedsætter det er at man ved ikke hvornår nedbøren kommer og dermed ved man helt, ikke helt hvornår øh, sortiden er. Øh, men det gælder for alt i verden om at holde på nedbøren, holde på fugtigheden bedst muligt. Det næste er også at for nogle afgrøder som ved for eksempel må det ikke være for tidligt så det får frost i blomstringsstadiet, fordi så kan det koste hele udbyttet. Så det er hele tiden en balancegang, der bliver justeret efter klimaet, og nogle gange er det selvfølgelig øh, mere, går det mere galt end andre gange. Okay. Thanks. So, to, to discuss the history and of how we, how we came to where we are with conservation farming, I'm just using the average wheat yield for the whole country. Wheat is the major crop, uh, something like 80 80 to 85 percent of the of the crop is wheat, um, and this is the average yield for the whole for the whole country from the 1850s right through to the current time. So the the light line going up and down that's the average. Um, the bl the black line is the five year rolling average, and the red line I drew I drew with my eye just for the to help with the discussion. <laughs> it's not fitted statistically. Um, and it goes right up to sort of where we are today. And for, my, for the discussion, I'll just talk briefly about each of these phases and how we were managing the land and, and, and how we made changes to sort of to move along there. Den that, historiske that. udvikling for vedudbytterne fra midten af 1800-tallet og frem til i dag med, med store oversvarationer, men den sorte linje, som er forstærket af den røde, viser jo sådan, uh, tendensen og, og uh, udviklingen til hvor vi er i dag, and of course there are a uh, huge difference in areas of wheat in this, uh, I guess it was yeah, small it was area. Changing. Yeah, that's right, the yeah. area is changing a little over time as well, yeah. yeah. So this first phase, I, I just called it the mining phase, but of course this is when we brought European agriculture to Australia. Mm -hmm. We didn't really understand the soils uh, at that stage, of course, even soil fertility. I think superphosphate was only invented um, in the, the later part of that. So we were really just mining the nutrition um, and you see the wheat yields, the average wheat yields just were on a, on a linear decline during that period. So in the start, man introduced the traditional traditions that had as immigrants, what they knew from Europe, they took the land with them and began to plow the land up. And it was a mine drift, so where they simply lived on the nutrients that were there. And they noticed that they started with 10 hectokilo and ended up with 5 hectokilo. Uh, yeah, so then we brought the moldboard plough. I mean, our soils were very shallow um, and hard, and um, when they used the moldboard plough, it would just uh, create these mud bricks when it rained, and then and then the soils would set very hard, and then you'd have to do a whole lot of tillage to to, to sort of deal with the tillage you just did. So we got into this uh, what what we call defensive tillage, you know. So. To fix up the tillage we just did, we needed to do more tillage. So this was just a, um, uh, our, our soils in particular, um, they have a structure and a texture that means that they, you know, too much tillage will really create problems. And so they were in a known circle where the uh, plowing then uh, gjorde at uh, ganske kort efter man er introduceret, så begyndte jorden at blive uh, uh, nærmest uh, brækker og, og, og med, med skorper, og så begyndte man at, at skulle kompensere for det, så man på grund af jordbearbejde blev man nødt til at lave mere og mere jordbearbejdning, og så øh, det han kalder, at øh, man laver defensiv jordbearbejdning. Altså, man, man skulle simpelthen løse det der problem, at det, øh, det blev komprimeret jord og øh, nærmest øh, mursten. Mm -hmm. um, and then in the 1900s, um, and just another click, and another one. Yeah, so there was two things that happened at the turn of the century. First was a, a guy called William Farrer, who realised that the European wheat varieties we were growing, the winter uh, long season wheat, were not suited to our shorter season, that we should be growing spring wheat. Uh, and also by growing spring wheat, we were able to avoid some of the diseases and also increase the quality of the wheat. So he was very famous and got onto our $2 coin for actually introducing wheat varieties that were better adapted. And we also uh, started to understand that phosphorus is extremely deficient on Australian soils, and so superphosphate um, came in. Um, a few other things farmers started to do was to fallow. So they would, they would because the soil 
nutrition had been had gone down, they had to do one year of fallow, you know, with nothing growing, in order to store enough moisture and nitrogen to grow another year of crops. So this so this fallowing uh, system also happened, and so you see. Initially, we got a little bit of a kick in yields that sort of responded, but then we just hit this new plateau where we were really just, uh, you know, going nowhere again. Yeah. Det der så sker det er nu er det med snavne ham der er på fængslet eller noget. Han ind han han indsøger at de vedsorter man har bragt med sig fra Europa, de duede ikke til de her klimaforhold, og derfor begyndte man at gå mere over i at dyrke vorvede og finde nogle sorter der var mere egnet til klimaet. Og samtidig kunne de lave nogle bedre kvaliteter, øh, og bedre udbytter og, øh, og velegne til brød. Og det der så også sker i øh, kurven her, det er, at fordi man nu havde udbygget jorden, så fik man nogle store udbytteresponser ved at tilføre superfosfat, som kom frem her i, øh, i øh, den nye øh, tidsalder, hvor man pludselig havde gødning til rådighed. Okay. Ja. Og så plader kurven ud. Um. And during that period, of, of course, we also um, started to shift uh, from moldboard plough to disc ploughs, which just allowed us to cultivate more land more quickly. Um, so, uh, and, and of course, that just further made the soil soil damage worse. Thanks. So, and, so and, this, mm. well, this was that they were in the Lerkenhavn instead of a moldplade plough. Og så øh, kunne man nå meget mere på kortere tid, og alt var godt, godt troet med, men det var også mere destruktivt for jorden. And then the tractor, which just allowed us to plow even quicker and more. So, so yeah, we were just plowing more and more often. So in spite of the fact we, we'd fixed up the nutrition, we got better wheat varieties, we were still uh, doing a lot of damage to the soil. Og så kommer traktoren til, så kan man også med plåren nå større arealer. I så før der stod halvanden hektar om dagen. Hey. Om ugen var det. Uh, <laughs> og, og nu pludselig kunne de få en øget kapacitet. And that led to more defensive tillage, um, uh, you know, and, and uh, together with the fallowing. And so there was there was an increase in the area, but you know, we we still had this fundamental uh, fully cultivated system. Vi havde stadigvæk et fuldt kultiveret system, men det glemte jeg også at sige før, de, havde, de måtte jo også indføre fallet, altså brak, hvor man havde øh, marken liggende et år uden at gøre noget som helst, for at simpelthen at samme fugtighed op til næste område. Og øh, man, øh, man, øh, man, man kan så også se, at øh, arealet øges ganske gevaldigt op i 30'erne. And like in the US, uh, we... We had, you know, enormous wind erosion in the southern Australia, um, enormous water erosion in areas with high rainfall, and also we had some weeds in Australia. This one's called skeleton weed, and this was a weed that spread by uh, vegetatively. So when you when you chopped it up with the plough, it's just like spread it all around the field and 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 replanted it in other places. And so this this became a very big uh, uh, sort of problem. Så det der skete, det er, at de fik næsten det samme, som vi lige har hørt om i Norge, der kørte, og man fik lige pludselig vanderosion og vinderosion, og så fik man noget nyt ukrudt, der, der blev kaldt skelet, så der vidt, altså skelet ukrudt, som havde den egenskab, at når man jordbearbejdede, så blev frøene spredt øh, ud til alle sider, så den invaderede markerne lynhurtigt. Ja. Og så i the in the late 1950s, we entered this uh, next phase. I think the realization that this this soil degradation needed to be um, dealt with, as well as the fact that farmers were relying on, um, you know, usually just the cropping. So if um, if you just yeah. so so this was when we started uh, introducing pasture lays to our farming system. So there would uh, in this. Uh, We started to grow grass, clover-based pastures for, for several years, and then the crops would be planted after that. And during the, the pasture phase, um, you'd build up the soil fertility, and then during the cropping phase, you'd use some of the soil fertility. And so there was a, a period there where there was some soil restoration. Um, as you can see, we got another kick in average yields in the, in the wheat, uh, but then again, it started to plateau off. So, so then we your crop. Det er det næste step, hvor man indfører øh, afgræsning, flereårig afgræsning, for ligesom at få jorden i, i god tilstand igen og få øh, næringsstofferne på banen. Og så ser man også, at så giver det et nyt hop i øh, udbytterne. And in Australia, the semi-dwarf wheat, the new green revolution wheat, was introduced in the 
1970s, but you see there was, ab there was absolutely no response to the, even though these wheat varieties had high yield potential, yeah. we didn't see any, we didn't see any, uh, we didn't realize the potential of that wheat until we changed our system. Um, and so, um, yeah, this just an example of the fact that new genetics won't help if your system sure. is wrong. So, yeah. so kommer der så en ny type ved uh, semi ved, som i virkeligheden havde et kæmpe uh, udbytte potentiale. Det kom bare aldrig til syn, fordi at vilkårene var ikke til stede, næringsstofferne var der ikke, jordstrukturen var der ikke. Men man vidste, at den kunne yde noget mere. Så der skulle ske noget mere. Yeah. Okay. So, yeah, so these, these um, legume pastures gave us some fertility, better weed control, the superphosphate and the clover, I mean the superphosphate made the clover grow well, the clover fixed nitrogen, so we had, you know, we had the system really um, improving. And also the farmers had uh, the sheep and the grain on the farm as two streams of income, so it gave the farm some resilience because of this really variable climate and the droughts, um, having both enterprises on the farm gave them some resilience. So that, so that, that system really underpinned farming in Australia and it, and, and it, and it still does mostly, although there's been a, I'll, I'll show you that we've started to reduce the area of pastures recently. Så du fortæller John om, at pastures, altså afgræsning med bælplanter i, det speeder det op med sundheden i jorden, og også ubrudskontrol, og det er altså noget, som vi også taler om i dag. Og så at det, at man havde kløver og bælplanter, og man kunne tilføre noget superfosfat, det øgede det også, og så fik landmanden yderligere et, 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 en indkomstmulighed i form af, nu har han både hvede og øh, uld, så han var ikke kun afhængig af at høste noget med majtasker. Ja. Mm -hmm. Okay. And so really, right up until the 1980s, we had this system of a pasture lay period of four or five years, followed by either wheat or barley, and then back to pasture. And if you just show the next slide, if you, if you see what the soil carbon levels were doing, they were increasing during the pasture phase, and then during a short cropping phase they would decline, but then they would increase with the next pasture, d decline with the crop, and so for a long period we were maintaining the levels of carbon you know, within, this, within this range. Um, but of course, if you started to crop for longer, then this would drop down into, into um, you know, low levels. Um, and, but that was really the system that, that were existed um, you know, right up until that period. So det viser, at uh, med, med, med det her uh, periode med græsning med forår og i virkeligheden i lang efterafgrøde, så bygger man kulstofindholdet op. Så hver gang man kom med en uh, høstafgrøde, så dykkede det, og så havde man igen opbygning og dyk og opbygning, og ja, yeah, sådan kunne man nogenlunde få det til at fungere. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Yeah. But within that system, when we were cropping, it was all still cultivated, fully cultivated. The, the residue of the crop would be burnt. There'd be repeated cultivations for weed control because there was, there was no other way to control weeds in those days. And so if you want next one. So we, we could still end up with soils that just started to crust and crack. And of course, if you're trying to store moisture and your soil does this when it rains, um, then uh, you know, the whole thing wasn't very efficient. So, so we were still getting soil degradation even in that, in that farming system because of the multiple tillage and, and burning of residues. Så det man gjorde, det var jo det, som man gjorde mange steder i husdyrfærdige egne i Danmark også i 70'erne. Man brændte halmen og afgrødresterne, og det var nemt. Og så kørte man gentagende jordbearbejdninger for at lave såbet eller bekæmpe ukrudt. Og så endte det med, at man brændte en masse kulstof af, og så fik man en jord, som i nogle gange øh, så ud som det der nede. Og det er så også, der, når der så endelig kommer regn, så kan den ikke akkumulere det regn, og det bliver øh, fordampet i stedet for at trænge ned i jorden. Så man havde virkelig skabt nogle problemer. Okay. And uh, we would see... Uh, this kind of thing happening, this, this was in 1983, a dust storm hitting Melbourne, uh, and this then started to make the politicians aware that something needed to be done, um, and started to do some uh, measurements of degradation, and, and, and so the, the policy, the government policy started to, to come on board with, with the need for change. Thank you. So, no it is så skete der det, der kom sådan nogle kæmpe støvstorm, og de nåede så også helt ind i byerne, hvor politikerne ikke kunne undgå at se og bemærke det, så derfor begyndte der at ske nogle ændringer i, at vi bliver, vi bliver nødt til at gøre noget. But as you've all seen recently, 
You need quite dramatic things in Australia to make politicians change. Som vi som vi ser netop også nu, det er der skal ret dramatiske ændringer til for at man kan få politikerne til at tage andre beslutninger. So really from the 1970s onwards the the, the earliest uh, interest um, in conservation agriculture in Australia started uh, largely among farmer groups and and then scientists uh, working with them. Uh, uh, and you can see um, really it's it's been it's underpinned this sort of um, quite rapid uh, shift from from the beginning of the 1990s really uh, a whole lot of things came together in a system um, uh, that's kind of taken the whole thing forward um, you and I'll show you we can we've certainly still have bad droughts um, where you can see the the yield drops right down largely because it doesn't rain but in a in a general um, generally the the um, overall average yield you know really kicked um, for 10 or 20 years during this period and I'll just talk a little bit about how that happened so the that's here in sister day there are at man indfører øh, nye dyrkningsmetoder øh, direkte såning, så stiger udbytterne, <coughs> men øh, der har også været nogle problemer undervejs, og øh, den del af øh, his, den historiske udvikling vil, vil John fortælle noget mere om nu. So the first one I mentioned was the political will, the, 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 uh, when, pe when people, particularly when city people saw this kind of thing, then they said what's going on. The second one was, um, the next, the next one was just economic drivers, so Basically, if you looked at the price that the farmer got paid for a ton of wheat in 1973 compared to 1982, it was about $100, and it didn't change very much. But with that $100, the farmer could buy 2,644 litres of fuel in 1973, and in 1982, 368. So it doesn't take much brains to work out that you want to do everything you possibly can on your farm not to be using fuel or labor or machinery or all of those costs. So very much a big driver was um, the terms of trade that farmers were operating in through those years were very, very tough. And then, sorry. Yeah. So det der sker, det er, at der kommer en politisk vilje til, at der skal ske noget, og så er der nogle økonomiske drivkræfter hos landmændene. Og der kan vi se, at hvedeprisen i 1973, det var 96 dollars, og i 82 var den 119, så den har stort set ikke ændret sig. Men øh, I kan se, hvad man kunne købe for den hvede. Der kunne du købe 2.644 liter brændstof i 73, øh, og kun 368 liter i 82. Så det vil sige, at... Øh, Bytteforholdet var simpelthen så forringet, så enhver kan regne ud, at man kunne ikke bare bruge en masse brændstof på jordbearbejdning, uden at det også var dårligt for økonomien. Mm -hmm. And the third factor, of course, were the technologies that, that came along that enabled us to adopt uh, less tillage, um, stubble retention and rotation, and, and, the, and they were herbicides, um, better machinery, and then the rotation crops we needed to sort of uh, bring in the diversity. So I'll just talk about them a little bit. So there's a lot of med at komme ny teknologi, bedre maskiner, også nogle nye og bedre afgrøder og sorter, og det gjorde så at der kom en en ny udvikling. Okay. So the first was the herbicides and I, and I, we don't probably need to talk about them much of course if you want to control weeds without tillage then you need another tool. Um, and those were a range of herbicides. Now herbicides themselves have now become a problem for us. Um, and I'll come back to that, but but initially, that these, this was the technology that allowed people to consider seeding, seeding without uh, cultivation. The second one was machinery development. And here it was mostly farmers with their welders in their shed, tinkering around and, and playing around with different points and different uh, openers and, um, and running field days and with, with groups like this, I think, learning from each other and eventually putting pressure on machinery companies to, to manufacture the sort of tech tools that would, um, that would be able to, to um, establish crops in, in heavy stubbles. And so generally they went from um, many cultivations to few cultivations to no cultivations to direct seeding. First of all with tines um, and now they're moving towards discs. So that's sort of been a trend I would say. Um, and uh, now with, um, with uh, precision agriculture, they can also do inter-row sowing. Mm -hmm. So they can, they can sow the crop exactly between the rows of last year's residue. So, so a whole lot of machinery improvements. We can't, you can't 
underestimate how important it has been to have the machines that allow you to do what you want to do. So that, and that, that was a lot of farmer involvement. So det, der vi så på den forrige slide, det er, at der kommer lige pludselig noget ny kemi, øh, forskellige typer også, der kan bruge til at kontrollere øh, ukrudt på. But these crops then gave us further opportunity to introduce um, more diversity um, in, in a rotation system. And of course, we got a lot of different benefits in the system from those crops. Så det, der også sker i 90'erne, der kommer nye afgrøder ind, der kommer lupiner ind, og der kommer raps ind. Og det giver nogle helt nye muligheder for at kontrollere øh, sygdomme, og øh, førhen var det kun ved at bygge, der blev dyrket. Og nu pludselig har man øh, mulighed for at styre ukrudtet, og man kan også få noget kvælstof fra øh, bælplanter. Og så er det meget nemt at håndtere øh, øh, hvad det, afgrøderesterne fra de her nye afgrøder. Ja. Og så really what happened through the 1990s, um, We basically had a period where cropping, cropping started to intensify. So, so the value of sheep for wool was going down. The value of crops was going up. So, so on the farm, the farmers started to increase the area of crop. And they were able to do that with no till, uh, by using no till, by using uh, either legume or oilseed uh, crops. Um, and the farms were also getting bigger at the same time. So, um, so this was all facilitated by uh, the adoption of no-till, increasing farm size and machinery size. And so a typical farm now might have a very short pasture phase or no, or no pasture at all. They, some farms just sold the, the animal flocks. Um, but they might have canola, wheat, lupin, barley in, in, a, in, a, in a rotation, something like that. So, This was sort of happening right through the, the 1990s and, and at the same time the adoption of no tool and stubble retention was just sort of climbing through that period. So det der så sker i 90'erne, det er at prisen på på uld og for, for kød sikkert også falder og økonomien i for bliver dårligere og dårligere. Så der bliver færre men større landbrug og på grund af no til øh, kapaciteten så vokser det voldsomt der står der 3,6 øh, per, per procent per år. Og det vil sige, at der kom, kom, fandt behovet for at have de her øh, afgræsningsperioder. Så de arealer falder også. Og så bliver det mere øh, egentlig høstafgrøder og øh, måske lidt mere presset sædskifte. Øh, så der sker en drastisk ændring i, i, øh, i de år med, med landbruget. Ja. Mm -hmm. Så so this is now then the, the adoption curve for no tool. Så so you kan se, how from the, from the early 70's when we first started to have uh, um, herbicides and started playing with it really from about 1990 the adoption took off so in places like Western Australia and Queensland where the erosion risk is very high wind erosion water erosion the adoption was very very quick they they saw very immediate benefits in other places in the country in the southeast uh, which had maybe a lot of animals uh, the more rainfall less erosion risk. It tended to be a little slower. They, they were a little bit slower to adopt no-till. Um, but you can see generally, I think now the adoption, there's 90% or something of the arable land in Australia would be, you know, farmers would consider themselves to have adopted no-till. And now a it's very typical to have this system of, um, you know, stubble retained, um, Sown, sown with no cultivation, into row sown with control traffic and auto steer and, um, and, uh, and increasingly with discs, although some farmers will still use tines and that really, that really sort of depends on um, often cost and other things. Um, but now they're able to establish most crops into the, re into the residue. Um, uh, so this is quite typical now. This is, uh, så det, der sker, det er, at uh, især i Vestaustralien, hvor det er meget tørkeplade, der vokser brugen af nødt til ganske voldsom. Uh, og så kan man se i den stiblede linje længst uh, til højre og nede, at det er så i Sydøstaustralien, hvor der er mere nedbør, der er udviklingen uh, noget langsommere. Men i dag er det typisk uh, 90 procent, uh, der er under uh, nødt til systemet. Og meget med såning, uh, uh, som vi ser der imellem uh, de gamle stuprækker, og hvor man etablerer uden uh, nogen som helst form for jordbærbrækker. Okay. Um, so, over this same period, um, 
farms have continued to increase, machinery sizes continue to increase, and labour efficiencies continue to increase. And so um, today, one, one labour unit, I've got a labour unit there. <laughs> That's an Australian labour unit. <laughs> They're managing 50% more land than they were in 1990. So, so you can see how efficiency, timeliness, efficiency, all these things are really important for them. Um, and, and it's important to be aware of, the, of those. Um, anything that slows down harvest, slows down seeding, um, is going to be difficult. So when we're thinking about new technologies, we have to keep it in mind that, that they have to be. That there's not a lot of labour available for them. So. So det sker det er at maskinerne vokser voldsomt, og kapaciteten vokser. Det betyder at en en arbejdsenhed, en person i dag driver 50 procent eller håndterer 50 procent mere areal end man gjorde i 1990'erne. Så det er kæmpe betydning. Yeah. Okay. Um, so, so I guess um, things were looking pretty good with that system, um, but then we hit this period uh, from 2000 till 2010, which we now call the millennium drought. So it pretty much didn't rain much for 10 years. And when we run into dry conditions, basically the break crops like canola and, and legumes tend to be a little bit more risky, mm -hmm. uh, whereas the cereals are still yield. So one of the responses to that, to that drought was to, to intensify the cereals again. Um, and, and, that, and, and when you intensify cereals in a no-till system where you're relying completely on herbicides for weed control, then you can run into some problems. And um, I'll t take the next slide. So, so that, that period where, where people stuck to their no-till system um, but, it, but basically had no diversity, so it was all cereals again, um, uh, saw the, the problem of herbicide resistant grass weeds just, just really explode. So, so our biggest problem is ryegrass. I think you guys have black grass, is that right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so we had ryegrass. It became resistant to every herbicide that every group, including Roundup, um, and the number of populations resistant to Roundup just started climbing. Uh, and so, um, you know, this, this became a problem with the sort of um, complete no-till system that doesn't have diversity. So I'm, I'm backing up uh, Jay's point that, you know, any one of the components of this system just taken alone, you know, won't, won't really work. You've got to be thinking about the whole system. So we got ourselves into a lot of problems with herbicide resistance. Um, we had to do a lot of learning about how to control this. And if you go to the next slide, uh, oh, sorry, go back. Oh yes, yeah, so uh, just, just go back, uh, go back one day. <laughs> Det var, at man røg ind i en 10-års tørke, og det betød, at afgrøder som raps og andre bredblade, de blev mere risikable og kunne ikke holde udbytterne, og så søgte landmændene over i kornafgrøder, fordi de var mere sikre under de der tørkeforhold, og kunne trods alt give et bedre udbytte. Og det vil sige, at så gik man fra en, en, en rotation, der egentlig var sund, så gik man over i meget mere kornbaserede sædskifter, og så begynder der at ske det uheldige, at herbiciderne begynder at virke ringere og ringere, fordi de bliver brugt for ofte. Og nu er de i en situation, hvor de pludselig har problemer med rejgræs, der er totalt resistent overfor alt ukrudtsmiddel og også ærerevhæl. Og det er så et kæmpe problem, at man er løbet ind i den blindgyde. Så so, um, that, that sort of taken us up to the kind of the current time, and I guess that um, for, for, for people who are, I guess, just starting the journey into sort of no-till or, or, or conservation ag, I guess looking back, I'd, my advice would be to sort of be flexible in, in your adoption and to really understand that you have to have diverse crops and practices, and I think this is something that, that Jay emphasised as well, um, to make the whole thing work. So, thanks. So, you know, no strategy is perfect for every farm or every paddock. So you may have to be, you know, adapting and adopting depending on the circumstances um, and, and not stick to... We, ha we have a saying, when you're on a good thing, don't stick to it. I don't know if that translates, but, you know. Altså, det der sker nu, det er, at nu bliver landmænd nødt til at være fleksible. De skal ikke være låst, og de, de bliver nødt til at have øh, øh, variation i afgrøderne og også den måde, man dyrker og håndterer på. Og der er ikke nogen øh, øh, strategi, der er perfekt for enhver farm. 
Og, øh, og så, øh, at når man tror, man har det rigtige, så er det ikke sikkert, det, øh, det passer, fordi det kan være en ny situation lige pludselig. And then the other one is to use diverse crops and practices because that provides the platform for success. And I think Jay made that point very, very well in his talk. So what I wanted to do now was um, show you a few examples of when uh, being flexible and pragmatic was, was valuable. So when maybe some tillage was useful mm -hmm. and when managing stubble was necessary and particularly when, uh, yeah, when diversity was really important to underpin everything. So I've just got a few examples from my own research. Nu vil John vise nu, hvordan det i nogle tilfælde er nyttigt at være pragmatisk, og så bruge det, der er nødvendigt, frem for at være fastslået i et system, hvor man ikke er klar til at foretage de nødvendige ændringer. Yeah, so the four principles I had at the beginning were, you know, reduce the tillage, maintain soil cover, and uh, for, the, for, for us that's, you know, residue mostly. Um, diversity and then nutrition. So I'll just one by one I'll I'll show an example of that. So the first one is tillage. The first are your vine. Um, and so we we now talk about strategic tillage. So our farmers are already, you know, been doing no till for, for quite a while and as and as I showed you um, <coughs> sticking to that principle and just um, and, and using overusing herbicides and not wisely. Um, led us into the herbicide resistance problem. Um, but there's other important issues in Australia. We have acid soils, and if we apply lime to the surface and we don't incorporate the lime, we don't have enough rainfall to, to get it into depth. And this can be a problem. Sometimes uh, some of the very surface compaction from livestock can be uh, uh, some very shallow surface tillage. Even just the tillage with seeding with a tine implement can be useful. I've talked about weeds, and we can also end up after very long-term no-till um, with all the crop residue and all the nutrients going on the surface with a very stratified uh, soil where all the phosphorus, for example, is sitting in the, so mm -hmm. in the soil surface. And of course, our soil surface spends most of the year dry, and if it's dry and the phosphorus is sitting there, it's not available to the plant. So we can have some real issues um, if, if that happens. Um, And then there are some diseases, particular diseases of, of uncultivated soil, such as Rhizoctonia and others, where, um, where sometimes if it's bad enough, uh, some, some disturbance is helpful to sort of break up some of those diseases. Og det der John nævner her, det er, at der kan være jo situationer, hvor det simpelthen er nødvendigt at afvige fra strategien med nødtil, og det er blandt andet, når man kører kalk ud, og de har virkelig nogle jorder med ekstrem lav pH-værdi, så ligger kalken jo bare op på overfladen, fordi der ikke er noget nedbør til at vaske den ned. Så kan det være nødvendigt at indarbejde kalken for at få en effekt i rodzonen. Det næste er også, at hvis det har været afgræsset meget, så kan der være sket komprimeringsskader af kvæg, der har gået der. Det kan være nødvendigt at så kompensere for det. Og så siger han, at der er jo selvfølgelig situationer, hvor det her resistente ukrudt, det bliver nødt til at blive grebet an med en eller anden form for øh, jordbearbejde, noget integreret jordbearbejde for at holde det nede eller bekæmpe. Og så siger han også, at øh, efter mange år med nødsel, så vil de have en meget, meget høj fosforkoncentration helt op i overfladen, og det er klart, at den kommer jo ikke ned til rødderne og er aktiv, fordi der ikke er noget nedbør af betydning, så den, den er meget delt i jordlagen. Derfor kan det også være nødvendigt at, at rode lidt rundt. Og så siger han, at det kan også reducere sygdomme og skadedyr i nogle situationer. Så det, det bliver de simpelthen nødt til at forholde sig til. Ja. Yeah. Um, so I'll just show one example. So this is a site uh, showing the pH um, and the soil depth. And the solid line is the direct drill or no-till. So that's a long-term no-till field yeah. where lime had been applied to the surface you know, at the rates that we would recommend, uh, had a good liming program. And you can see that the pH is just uh, very high on the surface. And um, when you sow a, say, a sow a legume crop, you, you're going to, uh, this, is, this is right where you put the seed of the legume, and the pH is 4.3. But if you take a soil sample from 0 to 10 centimeters, then it'll tell you that the pH is 5. So you don't think you've got a problem, but you've got a problem right where you're putting the seed. Yep. So some disturbance was ne is necessary under these circumstances to fix that problem. 
just one cultivation is enough and then they would return to no-till but if you don't fix this problem it'll end up it'll end up just costing you more because your legumes are not fixing nitrogen um, you know your crops are not yielding well so this is a circumstance in our dry areas with very low rainfall where the only way to get this lime uh, into the soil is to, is to incorporate it. Så det 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 John fortæller her det er at uh, i soil så er nok lidt dybere for at få fugtighed og der hvor han uh, de vil placere kernerne som han viste først det er der hvor pH er 4,5 og uh, det er absolut ikke uh, uh, velegnet men som han siger hvis man tager en jordprøve der tager han kun 0 til 10 cm det betyder det mindre end vi gør i Danmark. Hvis man tager en jordprøve så vil det sige at uh, uh, pH er uh, måske 5,2 uh, eller ja noget af den stil. Så man går ind og tror ud fra jordprøven, at man ikke har et problem, men lige der, hvor kernerne ligger, og det skal starte spiring, der har man et utroligt lavt pH. Og så skal jeg lige sige, at det, sige, at det her det er pH ved øh, analysemetode, hvor man øh, bruger calciumklorid. Og der mener jeg, at i Danmark, der lægger man en halv til. Er der nogen, der kan bekræfte det? Ja. Så det vil sige, at når vi siger pH 4,5, så er det altså i virkeligheden et reaktionstal på 5,0. Men det er stadigvæk meget lavt efter danske forhold. Og derfor bliver man nødt til at bearbejde det. Ja. Uh, the question is, on the so, so dry conditions, do you have earthworms and where yes. are they? Yes, we do. Um, they, they come to the surface in the, in the autumn when it, when it gets wet. Yeah. Uh, and in the, summer they, in the summer they go deeper in the soil and just yes. stay there. Yeah. Yeah. So. Uh, and what the earthworms, what we, we've shown what the earthworms really like is a layer of residue. They like to be chewing on the, they're a, they like to chew the fresh residue yeah. just sort of in under the soil surface. Yeah. Um, and uh, what we found was cultivation wasn't reducing earthworms by killing them, by chopping them. What it does is it breaks up their burrows and mixes all of, the, all of their food through the soil. And then they've got to work very hard to find it again and make new yeah. burrows. That reduces their breeding and then their population drops because of their, you know, they, they just can't spend so much time feeding and, and breeding. So I think in people's minds, they think that the cultivation is chopping them up and killing them, mm. but it's, it's actually wrecking their habitat. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. Og øh, de er dybt nede, når det er meget tørt, og så er de oppe i overfladen, ligesom i Danmark, så er det jo øh, afgrødrafter, de finder op i toppen. Men øh, når man så laver den her jordbearbejdning og andre årsager, vi har hørt, så reducerer man antallet af regnorm, hvor folk tror, det er fordi, man hakker dem i stykker. Men det er i virkeligheden, fordi man ødelægger deres mødegrund af afgrødet materiale på overfladen. Okay. Thanks. Other way? No. Yeah. So, um, I'm, uh, well, how do I put this? So, so for farmers who've been no-tilling for 20 years, to, to convince them to cultivate again uh, was very difficult. No, no, none of them wanted to do it. it it's costly. They, they really want to look after their soil. They've been doing it for 20 years. So they all were, were, were concerned that cultivation was going to undo all of the good that they'd done. And so... We set out to sort of, uh, and, but we were concerned that the soil acidity was maybe um, costing them more. So we set out to answer this question, whether would one cultivation, would a strategic cultivation, uh, for some reason, for some good reason, um, destroy the soil or, or, um, or would it recover quickly? So we set up um, a series of experiments on different soils where we went to fields that hadn't, hadn't been cultivated for 20 years and we cultivated them once. We just cultivated them once and then we went back to no-till. And we compared the soil chemistry, biology and physics for five years. Um, and I'll just show you the results. So this is a long, uh, uh, a field that had been in no-till or minimum till for 20 years, from 1990 to 2010, uh, either with the stubble burnt or the stubble retained. And you don't need to worry about that, just where it started. And then in 2011, I came along and I cultivated this, I cultivated the no-till just once in 2011. I didn't cultivate it anymore. And so then this are the yields of the crops from 2011, 12, 13, 14. It ran for five years. And basically, um, 
there's nothing to see because it didn't, it didn't have any impact on the yield at all, whether we retained the stubble, whether we burnt the stubble. We had four sites on different soil types with different cultivation. And we also, I said, followed all of the uh, soil parameters. Um, the soil carbon didn't change very much. The main thing that changed was the wet aggregate stability, which uh, declined uh, a small amount in the first year. But within one year of returning to no-till, it was up close to the levels where, we, where it was before. So, so we could give the farmers a little bit of confidence that if they needed to cultivate for some reason, for a good reason, um, that, and they returned to no-till, that the soil would, um, it, it wouldn't, it wouldn't do you know, lasting damage to the soil. <laughs> you don't want to tell us? <laughs> Men, uh, han har lavet nogle forsøg her, hvor de har lavet en jordbearbejdning en gang, og så uh, netop uh, af de der førnævn, der overtager, og så har det faktisk ikke givet nogen negative effekter. Der var en, en lille tilbagegang i stabiliteten i jordstrukturen det første år, men den kom faktisk ret hurtigt op igen. Og uh, I kan se, at udbytterne, uh, de, de uh, ligger jo faktisk rigtig fint derhen af. Så Ja, øh, det, han ødelægger ikke sin jord ved at gøre det, men I skal huske det under helt andre konditioner. Helt andre. <laughs> <laughs> how, how deep was that, was that one tilling? Uh, it was about 10 centimeters. Yeah. With a harrow or flower? With, a, uh, with difference. Um, so in this experiment I used a rotary hoe because I really wanted to check it. But it's a quite a sandy soil. The other soils were more clay soils and we just used farmer equipment. So a um, cultivator, just a tine. Uh, cultivator, we would call it, just um, but just one. Fixed chain. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. fast chains too hard. Uh, and we had a disc. We had a disc. We had disc uh, plow at one side, I think, in time. But just whatever the farmer would normally use to sort of cultivate the soil. Um, and yeah, we, and I had soil biologists and physicists. We measured the carbon. I thought the carbon might have changed more than it did, but from that one cultivation. But we didn't see we didn't see big changes in soil carbon. So. And just remember, it's just once. It's just once in 2011, and then we're back to uh, uh, no-till. Um, so, anyway, I, I mean, you would need to check this on your own soils, and, and, and uh, it's just that, from my point of view, if you've got a problem like soil acidity, which is just a hidden issue that's holding back your legume nitrogen fixation and your crop productivity, and, um, and you don't do something about it, then worrying about one cultivation is the wrong thing to be worrying about. So, so it's just a, um, uh, to, be, to be careful that you've got the other things in your system sorted out. Um, so, man can take a lecture on the night if it was necessary to do a and they used the that was for the they have the So it's all possible they have used, but 10 centimeters. Okay. Yeah, so in this case, we didn't... Uh, we didn't find any issue. So with stubble management, um, and Jay made this point, really I've, I, I led a project for five years, a national project about, on this, all sorts of different aspects of stubble management. Again, all Australian farmers want to retain stubble. Nobody wants to burn stubble. It's a terrible job and, it, and, it, and they don't want to do it. Um, but sometimes if their equipment, if they don't have equipment that can seed through the stubble, or if they don't set it up, as Jay pointed out, you've got to start I think if you push the next one, yeah, stubble management starts at harvest. So you know what seeder you've got, you know what your plan for is that field. You have to start treating the stubble, uh, you know, right from harvest. Now, for some people, it, so, so for the guys that are leaving a lot of residue, they'll use a stripper header, which is just stripping the, stripping the seed off and leaving very tall residue. Um, for us in Australia, because of our herbicide resistance, we now do a lot of what we call harvest weed seed management. So we try to catch the herbicide resistant weed seed at harvest by cutting very low, putting the seed through the header, and we've either got a mechanical destructor called a Harrington seed destructor built into the header, which is just, which is, which is just crushing the in weed the seed header? in the header. I've yeah. also seen them in the Yeah, now they're in the header. Okay. They, they actually put them in. Or we will bring the chaff out and concentrate it in a, just in one row so that all the weed seed falls in a row and then you only need to treat that part of the, pat, the field. Um, they used to try and burn those. Uh, they're called narrow windrow burning, but the, but the fires often got away. So now they just, now they just 
now they just put the they put the chaff they put the chaff onto the wheel track, mm -hmm. and then they just drive over it, and mostly that just breaks down the weed seed in that chaff layer. But sometimes they'll put one nozzle of of uh, herbicide. They can just go along with one nozzle in the wheel tracks, mm. and it and it. But that's a really important way that we've driven down the herbicide-resistant uh, weed populations by managing at harvest. So, uh, but you're still leaving all the residue on the soil. You just yeah. you just sort of adjusting. So, uh, uh, stoop hunting or helm hunting, this started in the first also for to success later. Og der er forskellige strategier, der er, som I ser til venstre, nogen, der øh, efterlader stort set alt på nær kern og kører med striberskærebord, øh, hvor stængen står tilbage, og det giver selvfølgelig ikke nogen problemer med at så i. Så er der andre, som øh, klipper helt i bånd og har teknik til at, at simpelthen lave så fin knusning, at ukrudtsfrøene bliver destrueret af majtasker. Og så er der teknikker, hvor man simpelthen splitter halmen i snitteren, sådan så det kommer ud og bliver lagt lige nøjagtigt i sporene så man har koncentreret de ukrudtsfrø, der ryger igennem maskinen i sporen, og dermed bliver de kørt i stykker ved de passager, der er. Og det er selvfølgelig nødvendigt med CTF-trafik for at gøre det. Og så er der endelig også nogen, der presser halmen og fjerner den, men der er ikke nogen landmænd, der har lyst til at brænde det af. Det er for risikabel, og de ved også, at de skal recirkulere næringsstofferne. Ja. Så er det jo kun avnerne. Avnerne er en klub. Det er kun avnerne. Det er ikke alt halmen. Det er jo ikke alt halmen, der er i meget tasker. No, yeah, the end of the day that comes out of the soil. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, so, so, if if you if you know your machinery is not going to handle a huge heavy stubble load, then we say, you know, think about how you're going to manage it. So this is this is being grazed by sheep, and and we've done a lot of we did a lot of studies for the no-till farmers to show that just letting sheep graze wheat stubble didn't damage the soil. We did that for 10 years um, because they thought in their mind that the sheep were damaging the soil. The only time sheep damage soil is if you let them graze the cover off. So it's the cover that's important. Mm -hmm. So what I say to people is sheep do more damage with their mouths than their hooves. Mm -hmm. it, it's, it's eating all the cover that's the damage, not, not the trampling. Um, and then this is this narrow windrow burning where they'll concentrate the weed seeds into a row and you just burn that row and leave the residue. Um, some people may incorporate if they're putting lime or something in and, and of course we're trying not to burn if, if we don't have to but sometimes in some very wet areas in Australia we've had situations where they haven't been able to get onto the fields during, during the crop. They get a, a big pile of stubble and a big heap of weeds and um, it, it's really difficult to manage so in very rare occasions they burn. I suspect that won't happen much anymore now <laughs> after the last a few months but um, uh, anyway, I mean the message is sometimes you'll need to manage stubble and if you need to manage it, you know, manage it, uh, mostly, mostly you'll be able to leave it and most farmers are trying to keep as much there as they can. Yep. So what you can do is that some people use it to reduce the rest of the rest and it should stop at that point that they are doing something good because some farmers think that the rest of 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 the rest hvis øh, alt er spist af, så derfor så skal de også der gå i øh, en eller anden form for stribeafgræsning i en periode. Og det næste er, at man, det hvor man har samlet materialen fra solgene øh, med ukrudtsfrøerne, så brænder man det her i sådan en kontrolleret afbrænding i striber. Og den tredje, det er, at der er nogen, der mener, at man skal jordbearbejde en lille smule og tilføre noget kan. Og så er der den fjerde, som er meget sjældent, det er, at man laver en kontrolleret afbrænding, og det bliver mere og mere sjældent, fordi det er netop også svært at praktisere og i tørregård meget risikabelt, som vi også har set i år. Okay. Ja. Um, yeah. Når vi prøver at forbedre mandsmænd i forhold til det der resistente grafisk neutralitet og sådan nogle forskellige rækkeafstande for at hjælpe, om de har et stort indsigt. That's a question. Have you tried different row distances? In uh, in, call, in call, uh, managing uh, weed problems. Yeah, the 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 trend for the last up until five years ago, the trend was for rows to go wider and wider yeah. so that they could retain more stubble and seed in between. But now, uh, one of the tools for weed control is co crop competition, and now the rows are coming back again <laughs> because actually the best thing to control weeds is a really vigorous crop, and so so actually they went out to about 30 centimeters. I can, yeah, centimeters. They went out to about 12, 12 inches, and, they, and then they've come back to 
uh, it used to be um, sort of 18 centimetres was normal, but now they're even coming narrower. Um, all for, all for uh, weed, herbicide resistant weed management. So, so we got ourselves in Australia into a terrible mess with herbicide resistant weeds and now we're having to uh, deal with that. Um, and, and that's one of the tools. So and this is an example of, a, of getting yourself into trouble with, with herbicide resistant weeds and, and a really good experiment to show um, how you can still manage your herbicide resistant weeds and still be profitable. Um, this was a project we call Se Sequences for Cedars. So it was saying, okay, have I got a disc cedar or a tine cedar and what's my cedar, what cedar have I got? Um, and depending on that, what, what kind of uh, sequence, crop sequence, so ro rotation or what kind of sequence of crops could I use that will really um, be suitable for my cedar? Um, and so um, the typical rotation or sequence in Australia is canola, wheat, wheat. Canola, wheat, wheat, canola, wheat, wheat. Sometimes it's just canola, wheat, canola, wheat, canola, wheat. So that's... <laughs> uh, and... What, happened, what happens in that system is you end, that's, that's herbicide resistant ryegrass in that picture. So this particular field had uh, 1,800 plants of ryegrass per square metre of herbicide resistance. Okay? So it's, herb it's resistant to most of the herbicides. Okay? So our question was, you know, is it possible for us to come in here and have a stubble retained, no-till farming system that's going to manage this herbicide resistant weed problem? Um, så det, det man øh, typisk har i sædskift, det er raps, hvede, hvede, og øh, mange steder har man jo øh, i jorden masser af resistent ugrudt, og øh, der er eksempler på 1.800 planter af rejgræs resistent øh, per kvadratmeter, og det giver så over to nogle kæmpe problemer med konkurrencen og undertrykkelse af hovedafbrød. Så derfor øh, øh, undersøger man, om ikke man kan finde andre måder at øh, bevare øh, stukken med, og også tilpasse strategien til en såmaskine, så og hvis landmanden han har en sandmaskine, så, så, så skal han ligesom tænke ind, hvilken afbrød og hvilken rotation passer bedst til den, så den kan håndtere systemet bedst muligt og tilsvarende med diskmaskiner. Mm -hmm. Så so the next slide. So we compared three strategies. The first one is called the conservative strategy. So that's growing canola, wheat, wheat. Uh, cheap canola varieties, open pollinated varieties, very cheap herbicides, tri trifluralin, and just just a, it's business as usual. Yeah. Okay, it's what it's what they were doing. Yes. We compared that we compared that with an aggressive strategy where you say I'm going to buy my way out of a problem. I'm going to use Roundup Ready canola. I'm going to use very expensive pre-emergent herbicides, but I'm still going to grow canola, wheat, wheat. And the third system was where we're trying to use diversity to manage the system. So this is vetch and it's cut for hay. So when you cut the vetch for hay, you remove a lot of weed seed, okay? So you get one. Then the vetch is a legume and you put the canola after the vetch mm -hmm. so that the canola gets all the nitrogen benefit from the, from, the, from the legume. And then you've got what we call a double break. You've got two broadleaf crops in a row, which helps you get another hit on the weeds. Then you grow wheat. Uh, and then you follow the wheat with barley. So that rotation allows you to keep all the stubble of every crop because canola will grow in vetch stubble, wheat will grow in canola stubble, and barley will grow in wheat stubble, and, uh, sorry, yes, and vetch will grow in barley stubble. Yeah. So the vetch, the vetch has got a very big seed and it'll grow in the, in the barley and wheat stubble. So, and you can see that over, far, over um, four years, Three, four years, the cost, so just bring up the next, okay, so the diverse one, there was more profit, there was less risk, we retained all the, we retained all the stubble, and at the end of the project, we had 250 ryegrass plants per square metre compared to 7,406 if we kept doing the same thing, or 800, so just an example of how Diversity in crops, diversity in practice can still allow you to, to manage a, a, a field even when you've got a horrible weed problem. Så det man så John har lavet et forsøg med, det er tre situationer, hvor man fortsætter med den konservative raps ved ved, 
og med low input og sparsomme omkostninger. Og der kan I se i, i kolonne 1, det er omkostningerne, og 2, det er deres netto øh, udbytte, og så er der et forhold mellem profit og omkostnings øh, øh, ratio. Og så i den sidste, der har vi så, hvor mange øh, frø, der er i frøbanken per kvadratmeter af det her rækkelads. Så prøver de en strategi, hvor man giver den endnu mere knald på og kører højere input, øh, GMO-resistente sorter og, og flere øh, herbicider på, og så stiger omkostningerne selvfølgelig. Og nettoudbyttet steg der også, men øh, der sker bare det, at øh, frøbanken er øh, selvfølgelig faldet, men øh, stadigvæk øh, mere er nærmere 12-14 procent af det, den var før. Det er selvfølgelig på grund af afgrøden konkurrerer mere. Og så har de så prøvet at in- inkludere vikke. Sådan så man har vægge og raps og øh, vintervede og byg i sædskifte. Og det betyder, at man har to bredblade øh, arter i sædskifte, og øh, væggen laver en kæmpe øh, konkurrence, men samtidig så høster man øh, væggen øh, ved at klippe toppen, hvor, hvor frøene er i, så man får destrueret frøsætningen i rejgræsset. Og som I så kan se, så giver det jo altså det højeste netto øh, proveny, og så giver det samtidig også en frøbank, der jo er under, ja, der er nærmest 5 procent, øh, er under 5 procent af det, der var i starten som udgangspunkt. Så man altså fået langt bedre kontrol med rejkrasset. And that is even though that wedge is cut for high. Yeah, you only have the, 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 the signage yes, use yes, of it. Yes. So despite you even remove one yeah. harvest crop, you mm-hmm. earn more yes. in average. Yeah. 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 Så selvom man fjerner en høstafråd, så tjener man altså mere samlet set på hele tiden. And I should say, uh, we, u- we use less nitrogen, we use less nitrogen fertilizer here too. Ja, og, og mindre, bare mindre gødning, fordi der er kvælt for produktion som har. Det bliver brugt det der, men... Ja, det bliver så brugt til til både formål eller høg eller hvad. And, and the reason we cut it for hay was specifically for wi- to get the herb the herbicide resistant ryegrass seed ja. out in the hay. Ja, og yeah. use it for feeding. And use it for feeding. Ja. Så de 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 klipper det ret højt, men for frøene væk, de frøer der er gemmeskrevet i ryegræsset, så de fjerner det for mange og bruger det til foder. Og så når de frøer aldrig at de skider. Okay. Um, yeah, so, I mean, like I said before, we've got a big problem with herbicide resistance. Um, and so I, I've mentioned diverse crops and end uses, of course, uh, rotating and mixing herbicides, having vigorous and competitive crops, which comes back to row spacing is another tool, harvest weed seed management, um, and then if necessary, strategic tillage. That, that last experiment was all no till, there was no cultivation there. So. So, you know, this, this is a problem we sort of created for ourselves by having no diversity, by relying completely on herbicides, by not managing them in a sensible way. Uh, and so um, just think, think, uh, herb, think about weed management in your conservation ag system and don't make the mistake we made. Uh, because I think parts of the US are certainly finding the same problem now when, when you just don't think about... Um, And of course, the spectre of losing glyphosate as one of the herbicides, if that happens, is you know another real issue. So, 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 so problemet er jo selskabt, og derfor uh, er det uh, også landmændene, der må finde en løsning til at komme ud af det problem, og det er for lige at opsummere, at det er simpelthen et, et, en varia- variation i sædskifte, flere bredbladede arter, og uh, en, en rotation, hvor man også bruger forskellige uh, herbicider, dem der nu er, og så skal vi have nogle kraftige og tætte afgrøder, der kan konkurrere, og så skal vi have noget høst, ukrudt, frø, management i, 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 i høstsituationen, hvor man prøver at sortere frøene fra at dem, og så noget strategisk jordbearbejde. Det er ligesom redskaberne for at komme ud af det her. Spørgsmål. Det der match, det vil ikke jo. Jamen, jeg, for, jeg forstår også om, at det er i skridningsfasen inden bestøvning, så når de jo ikke at blive til noget. Uh, that's a question. When, when you uh, uh, harvest this veg mm-hmm. and remove it, mm-hmm. uh, the risk could be to remove mm-hmm. seeds, but I guess it is in, in before uh, flowering, uh, yes. or shortly after flowering yes. of the yes. rice grass, before yes. it can germinate. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Så det er yeah. altså timing, der er vigtigt. Det må ikke stå så længe, så så falder frøen ned, eller man øh, flytter os lige indstykke i frøen. Det kan være nogen, der ikke er bestøvet eller kun kort tid. And the, and the other reason for that is, by cutting the ryegrass in spring, 
it, the soil then starts to accumulate the rainfall for the following canola crop. Mm. So the canola crop's the risky one that needs a lot of water yeah. and nitrogen. Yeah. And if you have a legume growing and you cut it for hay, then the soil starts accumulating water and nitrogen for the canola crop, which is the most risky and wants the most water and oh, nitrogen. So important. Mm. Uh, so the big thing is also that it's not just fieldstock that we can add to the rapture, but also we have done this with soil, so it gets in the way to accumulate rain, which is very important for rapture because it's a risky area in the dry period. So there are two things that we also speed up with fieldstock and water. Okay. Question: is that only cultivation or could it be a plowing? I could tell you a story that's going to make you very sad, but, but um, okay. You, you, and of course, you can tell them whatever you like because I don't know what you're saying. <laughs> So in Western Australia, Western Australia is the home of no-till in Australia. They were the first to adopt. They were the most rapid to adopt. They have sandy soils that compact and become acid. Uh, they, they overuse the herbicides. So they ended up with compacted, acid, sandy soils, which also became water repellent. So the residue, the stubble residue over the years can... The organic matter coats the sand and makes the sand water repellent. So when it rains, it just runs off like polish on a car. Um, so after 10 years, so after 20 years or more of, of constant no-till uh, with herbicides, they had, they had compact acid soils with uh, water repellents and herbicide-resistant ryegrass. And the way they fixed that was one pass of a moldboard plough with lime. Just once every 10 years they do that. And it, it buries the ryegrass seed, which and you never see them again. It uh, mixes the lime into depth where it's, where it's needed. Um, it uh, breaks up the... It brings a little clay to the surface which breaks up the non-wetting non sands. Um, and it breaks up the compaction. So, so I've, it's very ironic that, that the, in the home of no-till, they, they used a moldboard plough. And now, if, in, if you look in that book, that I've, that I've, there's a chapter in there about this. Um, and of course, you don't moldboard, we're not going back to the old days and moldboard ploughing every year. It's once every 10 years, and they have to be very careful how they do it and when they do it because there's still a risk of erosion, it's still there. They've got to be very, very careful how they do it. But it, it, it was a, a way to fix all of those problems, which, which had come from sticking on a good thing, sticking to a good thing um, for too long and just, you know. Their system, their system that they got into, long-term no-till with the same herbicides, same crops year in year out. They had no diversity. They just had a different monica uh, You know, they just had a different system, which they didn't have any diversity in. So they got themselves into a lot of trouble. So far, see the quality scare eight balls long. I don't mind. Nej, øh, John siger, at i Vestafstegnet har de jo overtrådt alle spilleregler. De har for det første noget sandet jord, noget meget øh, sur jord med lavt pH-tal. De har kørt øh, monokultur, øh, faktisk kun ved, ved, ved. Og så har de haft øh, øh, nøvtil i stor udstrækning. Og samtidig så har de på den måde fået bygget en jord op, som øh, havde skorpedannelser og ikke kunne tage imod regn, når der kom regn. Det var nærmest som om, det var voksbehandlet, så vandet bare løb af og fordampet igen. Og der har de altså virkelig haft øh, et, ja, så selvfølgelig resistent rejgræsproblem. Og der har de altså virkelig haft en gevinst ved at vende det hele om. Og øh, samtidig blandt kalk i, så de også får kalken ned i dybderne. And that makes me happy to hear that, because I follow uh, Bill Crabtree yes, on Twitter. Yes, yeah. And I've seen him as a hero. And suddenly he showed that he was doing deep tillage with tines <laughs> and plowing. And I lost every <laughs> It's just, Thank yeah, you. yeah. Uh, he even I, wouldn't dare to ask him why he did. Yeah, yeah. And so I guess we're trying to get, in this system of ours, which is dominated by wheat and canola, we're trying to get legumes into the system. And I, and I think in the last example, I showed you that we're trying to get legumes back into the system in many different ways. So we're trying to grow more profitable pulses like chickpea and lentil, which are more valuable and the farmers can make money from them as grain crops. Mm -hmm. 
We all, but we, all, we can also use uh, legumes as hay, as I showed you with the vetch, or we can use cover crops. And now we're trying intercrops, and it's the Canadians again, the, the pea, canola, intercrop. Um, we also want to try canola with lentils and chickpea because, um, and the Canadians are doing it with linseed. Our big problem with lentils and chickpea are disease, fungal disease epidemics, leaf ascochyta and things like this, which, which just make the crop very risky for farmers. If we could get an intercrop with canola that reduced the requirement for fungicides, we would... Uh, and, and of course, you can harvest the, the canola seed is small, the legume seed is large, it's easier to separate the seed. The canola sops up all the nitrate, makes the legume work harder. There's, it's, a really good, it's a really good interaction and we're hoping to get a bit more work going on it. So I, I took 20 Australian farmers to Canada la, uh, last year and we drove around for 10 days looking at intercrops in, yeah. in southern Saskatchewan. And, so, um, and then of course, just one more. Um, you know, I think farmers in Australia now, with, with animal prices back up again and realising how excellent pasture... There's, there's no better way to build soil carbon than with a pasture because it's there all the time. Um, and, uh, uh, and, and, and for those that have still got animals, I mean, that's, I think we're going to see the area of pasture increase. So these are all different ways that we're trying to just keep that legume um, there in the, in the pasture. So, so um, <laughs> der, er en, der er en kæmpe udvikling i gang nu, hvor man begynder at, at netop fokusere på den her sunde rotation, som jo har været fuldstændig glemt i uh, fortiden. Det vil sige, at man begynder at indføre uh, 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 linser og det, vi kalder chickpeas, som er en ærtetype, uh, enten i monokulturer eller i uh, uh, companion cropping, altså hvor man dyrker dem samtidig, og også hvor man uh, bruger det til hø. Og, øh, og simpelthen øh, bruger det på andre måder og fjerner det, og dermed også undertrykker ubrugsfrø og fjerner øh, det, der måtte være, øh, som kunne opføre mere frø. Og intercropping er altså, hvor vi, hvor vi samdyrker, at de bliver meget inspireret af kanadierne, men der er selvfølgelig nogle ting, de ikke kan overføre direkte på grund af nogle svampesygdomsproblemer. Øh, men det ser ud til, at øh, de, øh, de har fundet noget, der kan fungere med, med linser. Og så siger han, øh, så skal øh, afgræsningsperioder, det skal genopfindes. Ikke? Så det er noget, noget det sjovt, nu hører vi både Canada, øh, undskyld, øh, North Dakota, og Australien siger nøjagtigt det samme, at, 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 at drøbtykkerne er tilbage, og øh, afgræsning, øh, det er et middel. Så der er så lot of things. Øh, yeah. 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 When reinventing pastures, uh, I'm familiar with a new term from Australia called uh, no-kill cropping. Right? No-kill cropping. Yeah, so seeding into pastures. Yeah, to reintroduce uh, species or just introducing other kinds of species on the, in pastures. Is there uh, a link between that and the plant producers or is it only on the uh, animal farms? Um. Mostly, well, mostly, the, obviously on an animal farm, the pastures are, you know, they'll, be, they'll become part of the system. For the guys that have sold the sheep, you know, like a lot of farms just got out of animals altogether and went fully cropping. And for them, uh, you know, for them, the opportunity to, to bring legumes back in is more difficult. Mm -hmm. um, they're probably using short-term cover crops more than, than pastures, but they may be using some of the pasture species in those, in those cover crops. And I'll show, I'll show a few pictures of, a bit about what those, those guys are doing. But um, there is some uh, what we call pasture cropping, where people will have a perennial, there's a lot of Australian perennial crops which um, only grow in the summer, and then they're very winter dormant. And you can basically grow them in the summer, graze them with animals, and then in the winter, you can just seed into them. They don't grow at all in the winter. They just sit there. They're alive, but they're not growing. Mm -hmm. And it's sort of called pasture cropping. You need to be in a fairly high rainfall area that gets rain all year round to do that, but some people have been doing that. Uh, yeah. mm. I have a question. Yeah. Uh, it seems as if veg has an allelopathic effect when it is grown in monoculture. Can you confirm that from Australia? That on allelopathic effect yeah, on... Yeah, that on it, it makes a chemical uh, reduction of weeds that 
Oh, yeah. Outcompetes weeds also not by sun stealing the sunlight, but yeah. also by uh, chemical. Yeah, that, uh, that could well be could well be so. I, I'm not aware of it, but yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. it's extremely uh, competitive yeah. as a, as a cover yeah. crop. Yeah. 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 So we are really good to compare with my own food in yeah. monoculture. Yeah. Okay, so I better keep moving. Same with rice. Yeah, there are grains. You don't have to worry about it. So, they may not begin to to outcompete. Men rapsen har den fordel, at den kan gro på væggen i højden, typisk i efteråret. Hvor honningmuret, den kan gro op over rapsen. Ja, yep, next one. Um, so the last of the, so I had tillage, uh, stubble, diversity, and then I just wanted to talk about this nutrient balance. I, I spoke about it at uh, the conference in Herning, mm -hmm. and so I guess you might be able to direct people to that. I think the talk will be available, because uh, yeah. I didn't want to go through it again. No, but, okay. but, um, when you're thinking about, so, so my message here is, the, the sort of simple message here is people talk a lot about soil carbon and you don't find carbon in soil. You find organic matter in soil. And organic matter is carbon, nitrogen, phosphorus and sulphur in quite constant ratios. Okay? Whether you're a human, whether you're a, 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 um, a microorganism, soil organic matter, wheat straw, you know, these the stoichiometry, as it's called, the ratio of these nutrients is quite uh, relatively constant. Det her det er meget vigtigt. Uh, John går ikke ret meget ind i dybden omkring det her sagde noget på plantkonkurrencen, men det er et, et helt nyt uh, uh, input i kulstoflæring. Men det han siger, at uh, kulstof i jord er i mikroorganismer hovedsageligt. Og uh, når vi har kulstof i jorden, uanset om det er i humus eller undervejs til at blive humus, så har det altid samme forhold imellem de fire elementer. Kvælstof, fosfor, svovl og kulstof. Kulstof har det fået fra luften via fotosyntesen, men de andre ting, de skal være til stede enten fra bælplanter eller gødning, når det er kvælstof. Fosfor kan komme fra jordens ressourcer eller fra gødning, og svovl er mange gange et uh, mange uh, symptom. Så det svarer til, hvis vi vil bygge en mur, og vi mangler øh, øh, vand i mørtlen, så vil vi ikke øh, ligesom få et godt resultat. Og det er det samme, vi kan ikke opbygge kulstof, altså humus i jorden, hvis ikke vi har alle de der byggeelementer til stede. Det er det, som er øh, noget af det meget, meget spændende forskning, de har lavet i Australien, men som John åbenbart ikke vil kunne ret dybt ind i nu her. Men han fremhæver de der bestanddele i jorden, hvad det består af. Yeah. Mm. So most of the organic matter in the soil is in, in this, fine, people call it the fine fraction, the humus, the stable, the resistant, um, but, but it's mostly made up of dead microorganisms. Okay, so, in, but in order to create dead microorganisms, you've got to grow live ones and have them die. <laughs> um, and of course, if, if you're expecting that material to provide nutri nutrients for you, nitrogen, uh, mineralization. Obviously, if you want to build it, then you've got to f you've got to put the nitrogen back in from somewhere. Um, and this was the sort of uh, thinking. I had a PhD student. Um, might go to the next slide, and I'll. I'll, uh, so, I'll, I'll yeah, the, sorry. Explain the. Uh, we, 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 når vi ser jordens bestanddel, så har vi det blå del levende organismer. Det er under 5 procent. Det kan det selvfølgelig være her. Så har vi en grov del, den grønne, der er under 10 procent, og så har vi den fine fraktion, der er over 85 procent. Men som, øh, hvis, 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 hvis vi har stabilt humus, der ikke er i fare for at blive nedbrudt nemt, så består det af 65 procent døde mikroorganismer. Og det er altså også indlysende, at hvis ikke vi har ret mange mikroorganismer i jorden, så kan vi heller ikke lave humus. Det er ligesom en del. Nej, det skal levende mikroorganismer til at lave døde jo. Ja, det skal jo først være levende. Ja. Så... Ja. Yeah. There's a question when they die, and I will guess they each eat each other. Yes, yes. They outcompete each other and mm -hmm. so on. Altså, de, de, de æder hinanden, og nogen uh, udkonkurrerer og andre, og, og, og ligesom mennesker gør. Mm. I think, I think... Uh, <laughs> yeah. But anyway, just, just keep this... Keep that. If you go back, just go back one. I, if, if you just go back one slide. So it's just important to. The, the thing is to think about. A lot of people think of organic matter as dead plant material. Okay, and the coarse fraction, the green, that's that's mostly bits and pieces of dead plant. But uh, but the humus, and a lot of people think of that as you know chemicals or. But a lot of it is dead microbes. And if you and if you 
If you think of it as dead microbes and you think that, okay, to get dead microbes, I've got to grow lots of live microbes, well, then the story of soil organic matter makes a bit more sense. And so if you go to the next slide, so I've been managing a no-till experiment for 30 years. And after 20 years on this experiment, and you can see the level of residue, you know, the, the average wheat yield was five ton per hectare, so there's plenty of residue. I should have been building soil carbon where I was retaining all the stubble, um, not cultivating compared to where I was burning and cultivating. But after 20 years, there was very little difference in the soil carbon. And this really annoyed my soil science friend. Uh, I was mystified because I thought, well, what am I doing? And, and there's many studies that have shown over many years, no-till versus retaining stubble often wasn't changing the soil carbon very much. And we, we, we weren't really sure why. Så det, uh, John oplevede, det var, uh, som også gjorde frustreret, at de havde nogle langtidsforsøg, der ligger i 20 år med nøvetil, hvor de egentlig havde gjort, hvad man skulle gøre. Man har haft efterafråd, man har efterladt halm, og tilsvarende havde de også nogle af de her jordbearbejdere, hvor de havde brændt halm en anden dag. Og uh, desværre, uh, det var meget, meget uh, svage ændringer, der var i kulstofindholdet i jorden. Og det kunne han simpelthen ikke forstå, fordi uh, der burde jo i virkeligheden være en opbygning i uh, nøvetilsystemet. Mm -hmm. So if you go to the next thing. So um, if you accept that soil organic matter has a constant ratio of carbon, nitrogen, phosphorus and sulfur, then it could be that you've got plenty of carbon going into the soil, but not enough nitrogen, phosphorus or sulfur. Now remember I'm talking about Australia where our soils are very infertile. And you're talking about me as the agronomist, and I'm very tight with the fertilizer. I just put the fertilizer on when the crop needs it. And so our hypothesis was maybe it's the nutrients and not the carbon that's limiting carbon sequestration. So John fik ideen, da, han, da de konstaterer, at der altid er samme indbyrdes forhold mellem kulstof, fælser og fosfors forhold i øh, stabil humus, så er det også indlysende, at så kan mange på et af næringsstofferne øh, begrænse opbygningen af humus. And if you know those, and because we know the ratios of carbon, nitrogen, phosphorus and sulfur in the organic matter. It's very similar to the ratios in the microbes that make the organic matter. Um, we know those ratios. And if we know what we're putting on in wheat stubble or hay or whatever, it is, manure, whatever you're putting, it on the, putting on the soil, if you also know those ratios, then, then you can estimate how much nutrient, is one of those nutrients, is one of those nutrients, you know, is there not enough to be fixing all the carbon that you're putting in there? Det, der er også et tilfælde i Australien, det er, at landmænd er selvfølgelig meget nære i ved at tilføre næringsstoffer, fordi det er et risky område at dyrke i, så de har ikke tilført overskud af næringsstoffer, så det er nogle ret næringsstoffattige jord. Og derfor øh, kan man gå skridtet videre, som John siger, at når vi så ved, hvad vi tilfører, hvad der er i øh, staldgødning for eksempel, eller handelsgødning, så kan vi begynde at styre til at ramme mere plet med at der bliver næringsstoffer til rådighed til at lave den her komposition af organisk materiale. So the picture on the on the on the your right is a simple experiment wet wet sandy soil with chopped up wheat straw put in it and put in a bottle for for a few weeks. On the left hand side just the straw on the right hand side with the nutrients added. After five weeks in moist soil that's the difference. <laughs> Så det, de gjorde for at arbejde videre med hypotesen, det var, at de tog simpelthen noget jord og puttede ned i en flaske. Så i den til højre, der tilførte de de næringsstoffer, de netop havde beregnet forhold imellem. Og i den til venstre, der tilførte de ingen næringsstoffer, men samme mængde strå. Og så lod de det stå i de der flasker for... Five weeks. Hva? Five weeks. For i bare fem uger, og så havde de den her farve. Det, det er jo lidt... Det, ja, øh, det, det er jo altså banebrydende. Der sidder a short time for such impressive color yeah. difference. Um, the, sorry. Yeah. Kender man, hvad er det forhold? Ja, det kender man. Ja. Her er det også, hvad er det radio? Ah, uh, it, yeah. So for every thousand kilograms of carbon, you need about between 80 and 100 of nitrogen, about 23 of uh, phosphorus, and... Yeah, 18 or, or something of sulfur. It's it's. I, I've I've got the numbers. A uh, thousand carbon, 85 nitrogen, 23 
phosphorus and uh, a little bit less, a little bit less sulfur, 14 or something sulfur. They're the ratios. So, so if, for example, for a ton of wheat straw, one ton of wheat straw, you need five kilograms of nitrogen fertilizer, about two of phosphorus and about one and a half of sulfur. So. Uh, for at uh, uh, nævne den her, det er cirka 83 til 100 kilo kvælstof, uh, 25 kilo fosfor og uh, 14 til 18 uh, svovl til 1 tons kulstof. Og det vil sige, at til 1 tons vedhavn skal der blandt andet tilføres 5 kilo kvælstof. Men uh, det vigtige er jo, at uh, 1 tons kulstof, det repræsenterer, at der er optaget 3,7 tons CO2 fra luften via fotosyntesen. Så det vil sige, at hvis vi skal forøge vores kulstof i jorden, men et, bare et ton CO2, så skal vi have den mængde næringsstoffer til rådighed. Og det vil sige, at skal vi nu være rigtig clean ord, fordi vi historisk set har kørt med en, øh, en undergøsning, og hvor der slet ikke har været noget til bane og har været fjernet. Er det årsagen til, at vi ikke har set nogen koldstofopbygning i Danmark? Ja, det mener jeg. Samtidig har jeg lige hørt på plantgårdgræsset Jørgen E. Olesen sige, at vi kan ikke bruge... Øh, Johns teori, for der er masser af næring i de danske jorde. <laughs> øh, ja, men der er altså ikke 300 kilo ind i overskud, og der er heller ikke 75 kilo øh, fosfor i overskud. Og det næste er også, at på danske jorde kan man ikke generalisere, for på de østdanske jorde, der er der steder, hvor vi kun har 1% kulstof i jorden. På de, på de jyske har vi meget mere, det viser kvadratmeter. Og hvorfor har de jyske det? Så siger man, det er fordi vi har husdyr. Ja, men når vi har masser af husdyr, så har vi også meget mere næringsstof. Det vil sige, at på kvægeegendomme i Jylland for eksempel, der har man jo haft de her næringsstoffer i højere grad, fordi man har en helt anden øh, afbrødet rotation, hvor på de østdanske jorde netop har mange næringsstoffer. Så når Jørgen Olsen siger, at vi har masser af næringsstoffer, så tror jeg, det er rigtigt nok i mange øh, øh, egne i Jylland. Men vi har delt med også det modsatte på Østjylland og Lolland Falster især. Det ser jeg jo Så, ja. Yeah. Uh, where are we? Uh, I'm not sure. There's a lot of questions. Yeah. <laughs> I probably should finish the story too, but I'll, uh, John, I'll finish John, the story. John will finish the story and then you can see if you set up Yeah, I'll finish the story about the soil we're going to come. Um, so, I, for my experiments, I was using fertilizer to provide the nitrogen, phosphorus and sulfur. If you think about the Australian farming system, we used to apply superphosphate, single superphosphate, that's phosphorus and sulfur, to a legume pasture, which provided the nitrogen. And then we had the, the pasture there growing permanently. So, you know, we had the carbon going in, we had the phosphorus, we had the sulfur, and the, the legume was fixing the nitrogen. I think Jay, in some of his systems, he's got the legumes fixing the nitrogen. He's encouraging mycorrhiza to get the phosphorus from the soil. So, so I did the experiments with fertilizer to, to show the principle. But there's ways to get nitrogen free. There's ways to get more phosphorus from the soil. So... So I don't, uh, you know, I don't want people to think you have to do it with fertilizer, but, but um, sometimes you may need, we, in Australia we need to, we probably certainly need some phosphorus fertilizer, but, but the principle is um, don't ever think of carbon as just carbon, it's organic matter, and you always have to have the nutrients there or you won't build organic matter. So John Hanks i værksættet forsøg, hvor de på øh, afgræsningsarealer havde bælplanter til at levere kvælstoffet, selvfølgelig havde de CO2 og kulstoffet, den findes i forvejen, og så tilførte han øh, fosfor, som, øh, fosforkøden, som også indeholdt svor. Så nu fik han pludselig alle næringsstoffer øh, på banen. Og han siger, at det behøver ikke at være den eneste måde, men han nævner også, at efterafbrøderne er vigtige til at bidrage med en del af næringsstofferne, og også det fosfor, der ikke er tilgængelig i jorden. And then you can tell this story. So, what happens when you put a whole lot of wheat straw into a soil? You give the organisms, the microorganisms in the soil, they get all this carbon, but they don't have any nitrogen, phosphorus or sulfur, because there's very little of that in wheat straw. So where do they get it? They actually break down the existing organic matter to get the, to get the nitrogen, phosphorus and sulfur they need to deal with all the carbon you've just given them. So they, so they use a whole lot of the, old, the existing organic matter, they release enzymes, they break that down, they get the nitrogen, phosphorus and sulfur they need to deal with all the carbon you've just given them. Um, and in that process, they blow off a whole lot of CO2, uh, you lose a whole lot of your old carbon and you don't sequester much of the new carbon. Så hvad sker der, når vi så tilfører en øh, høj mængde sprog fra, fra en vedafgrøde på jordoverfladen? Ja, så går bakterierne i gang og siger, at vi vil gerne nedbryde det her, fordi det er, det er godt for os. Men de har øh, en masse kulstof i halmen. De har bare ikke noget kvælstof, fosfor og svogl, eller i hvert fald ikke tilstrækkelige mængder. Derfor så begynder de at nedbryde det humus, det organiske materiale, der er i forvejen. 
Og det vil sige, at under den proces, der bøvser de en masse CO2 ud, som øh, faktisk øh, fiser tilbage igen. Og det vil sige, at der sker et drop i den eksisterende humusmasse i jorden til fordel for at nedbryde den halm, der er efterladt af mig tørsten. Mm. Or, if, the, if, the wage, if to the wheat straw you add some nitrogen, phosphorus and sulfur as fertilizer, which I did, or if you're adding manure or compost or some kind of cover crop mixture, so anything to get the balance of carbon, nitrogen, phosphorus and sulfur to be more similar to what the microorganisms need, uh, then what happens is when you add that to the soil, uh, they sequester more of what you've given them and they don't break down the existing organic matter. So you get a, you get a double effect on, on building soil organic matter instead of breaking it down. At the same time, you release less CO2 to the atmosphere. So it's also got a climate change uh, benefit as well. Og hvad sker der så, når vi tilfører den samme mængde halm til en jord, hvor der er næringsstoffer til rådighed, for eksempel fra en foregående efterafråd, der har frigjort en masse, eller man har suppleret med noget øh, husdyrgødning eller handelsgødning, jamen så har vi netop øh, den situation, hvor vi ikke tager på den eksisterende humus, men bakterierne går i gang med at nedbryde det her nye kulstof, der ligger i halmen. Samtidig har vi ikke den her CO2-udledning for nedbrydning af det gamle humus. Det vil sige, at vi får en netto større indlejring af organisk materiale eller kulstof, end der var i den anden situation. Hvor er det lige, at jeg får svoglen fra, så frem det ikke bare køber i superfosfat? Og kan jeg frigøre noget Uh, vi kan i hvert fald se, at efterafgrøder optager svogl. Det har vi set ved pandaanalyse i Agrovi. Vi har, vi har fundet helt uh, op omkring uh, i en rigtig effektiv efterafgrøde. Der fandt vi, som jeg lige husker det, omkring 15 til må, måske endda 20 kilo svogl per hektar. Så kan vi diskutere, hvor den kommer fra. Men det korte lange er, at den svogl er optaget efter høsten. Så det vil sige, at vi har i hvert fald, om det er frigivet fra nogle depoter, eller fanget fra noget, der vil blive udvasket, eller hvad, det ved vi ikke. Så er der i hvert fald svogl til stede i den her efterafgrøde. Så det vil sige, at vi holder, ligesom andre næringsstoffer, også noget svogl og også noget fosfor via de her gode efterafgrøder, som vi så igen bliver frigivet langsomt. Det kræver selvfølgelig, at der er en, en forsyning fra halmen lander på jorden, snittet halm, til den her efterafgrøde, den en gang bliver brudt ned. Der skal selvfølgelig også være noget let til gengæld. Men, men svogl, vi ved jo, at det er noget, vi skal tilføre, fordi det har været øh, øh, reduceret fra nedvastning via øh, forurening i 70'erne. Så, så i de fleste tilfælde må vi jo købe det. So you ask where, where the sulfur comes from, and I say, some from the cover crops, but in most cases we have to buy it because it doesn't mm -hmm. come with the rain anymore. Mm -hmm. no. yeah. Yeah.